join. Hey there, Patrick from Brentwood. How you doing? We've got, a, at least we've got a piece of testosterone on this call. So <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Hi, Veronica. Oh, Veronica from Oakland. This is Vanessa from Oakland. So you're already my friend. Already my friend. Sam, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you for getting it right. My name's always butchered, so I'm pretty particular about that. I'm looking forward to connecting with you as well. Hi there, Vanette from San Francisco. Nice to meet you. I'm just, I'm just chit-chatting, Deb, so you cut me off at any time. I'm just trying to kill time. <laughs> uh, no worries. We're at that, at that time, we promised, 6.05, so we're going to get started. So I'd like to take this time to welcome each and every one of you, and especially our speaker tonight, Renessa Boley Blaine. Uh, thank you for attending this webinar entitled Creating Your Perfect Work, which is hosted by the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter of the National Black MBA. My name is Deb Watson, and I'm the president of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter. We have over 39 chapters throughout the U.S. Um, this organization's mission is to provide opportunities for our members to increase their intellectual growth and economic wealth with a framework that centers around five pillars of engagement through programs that promote career, education, entrepreneurship, leadership, and lifestyle. The National Black MBA engages with supporters and corporate partners to achieve these goals on behalf of our members. Although the name of the National Black MBA Association is such, however, membership in this organization does not require that you have an MBA to join. Our goal is to support education and your future growth. It is also with great pleasure that I take this opportunity to introduce Renessa Boyle Lane, who is the founder of the Perfect Work Academy and author of the book, Fast Lane, Wrong Direction, Insider Secrets to Redesign Your Success and Reclaim the Passion, Purpose, and Balance You Lost Along the Way. Renessa takes women who have grown bored, burned out, and unfulfilled in their career and equips them to create their perfect work, be it radically changing careers, launching a business, or bringing a big idea to life. Renessa's mission is to equip women everywhere to discover, design, and get highly paid to do the work they love. She has been featured in such publications as the Washington Post, Career Builder, Huffington Post, and CNN.com, as well as ABC, NBC, and CBS affiliates throughout the country. I'll now pass this mic over to Renessa so that we may jump right into this presentation. Alrighty. Hey there, folks. I am super, super, super excited. So uh, I usually do, is this mine? I hope this is not mine. Let me try, turn off my email, sorry, so that we don't keep getting dinged. Um, but I'm super excited about this conversation. A, this is my wheelhouse. This is my absolute favorite topic to talk about. And B, it's an opportunity for me to talk to folks who are local. Um, and so usually folks are coming from all over the place. And so as folks were signing in and saying where they were from and this and that, it was like, oh, I recognize that city. So I'm feeling at home already. Um, so get your pen and paper handy. I've got so much content um, to throw at you. I will leave myself open um, for Q&A at the end as well. So um, I have got time. Um, so if you want to connect with me after that, uh, feel free. But let's dive on in. Get your pen and paper handy, whatever device you take notes with, um, because I'm going to blow your mind with some stuff. Because um, again, this is my absolute favorite topic. So let me just get on, share my screen, um, and then we're going to just blow it away. So I'm going to leave it to um, Melsha and or Maisha or anybody to man the chat. So if there's something that comes through that really should get my attention, let me know. Um, and I'd be happy to, to kind of interrupt. We'll save a lot of questions for the end, um, but if there's something I need to know, you know, dive on in and let me know. So 
big question is why are we here first and foremost so this conversation is for you if you are a high achieving well man or woman i work a lot with women but i work with men as well but that you've grown bored burned out or unfulfilled and you're ready to create your perfect work that can mean radically changing career that could mean launching a business that could be bringing a big idea to life because here is what i believe there's two things one i believe that every person deserves to do work that they feel like they were born to do the career business that they know that they know that they know that they were meant to contribute to the marketplace and i believe that every person deserves to get highly paid doing that and so what i teach is all about that intersection of money and fulfillment and contribution and impact and all of that the bigger question though is why are we having that conversation now because here's the deal there's so much going on around the globe and people are getting laid off people's businesses are are suffering people are struggling and so common sense would say you know this is the time to start hunkering down this is the time to play it safe this is the time to kind of ride it out but the reality is that at the end of every crisis there is always a remnant of folks who who have a windfall like there are some real estate investors who are about to clean house there are some stock investors who are about to clean house there are products and services and innovations and businesses that are going to be born out of necessity because of all that's going on in the world all that's being disrupted there are roles that are being added to companies right now as a result of all that's going on with covid 19. there are folks on this call you have a message that you need to get out to the marketplace that the marketplace did not want to hear six months ago but they're ready to hear it now so now is the time if you're at a place where you know that something needs to shift you know that you're not fulfilled you know that you want more in your work the time is now to begin dealing with that so here's what we're going to cover in, in our time together so across the next hour i'm going to reveal the four specific questions that will instantly shift you from no idea to crystal clear on the ideal role in a new career or business and so I'm going to tell you, I, it's rare that I ever find um, somebody who's like, I just don't know what I want to do. They just have not asked the right questions. And we're going to talk about that. You ask those for four specific questions, you nail them honestly, you figure it out is a wrap. You will be doing work that you love and you will be getting highly paid for it. We're going to talk about how to strategically transition into meaningful work that excites you without going broke. Because I do not believe in dream job and broke. <laughs> and I don't believe that, you know, you know, do what you love and the money will come. Like that's a recipe for broke. And so we're going to talk about the strategy on how you do that. We're going to talk about the number one mistake that will prevent you from getting highly paid in a new career or business and what you need to do about that. We are going to focus on the three simple actions that I took to secure my first $18,000 client when I made the leap to create work that I love. And let me be very, very clear. This session is not about quit your job and start a business, right? Perfect work can take so many different forms um, from starting a business to, you know, whatever. But some of you might be looking to make a radical shift in your career. Some of you might have a big idea that you want to bring to the marketplace in the form of a nonprofit or some, something like that. So I'm going to show you so many different examples of all of those scenarios. Um, and you're going to be able to see how those principles can be applied to the to whatever idea you've got going on in your head, right? Um, I'm also going to share the why your past successes, not your fears and failures, might be the biggest roadblock that's keeping you from getting paid doing work you love right now. Because everybody on this call, if you're in, you know, National Black MBA Association, that means that you're smart, that means that you've got some skills, that means that you're resourceful. But oftentimes it's our past successes that will keep us and will hinder us. And so we're going to talk about how that comes into play. And I'm also going to focus on the perfect work framework. So these are the exact steps I take people through to discover, design, and get highly paid to do work that they love. It is so simple to do, but simple and easy are two very different things. And we're going to talk about that as we go. Fair? So um, I think if you registered, you've already gotten access to the success and happiness test. If you have not taken that test already, take it. It is a free gift to you um, for being a part of, of this webinar. And the success and happiness test is great. You go, you, you put in any goal. It could be a goal to become a leading authority in your field. It could be a goal to write a book. It could be a goal, whatever it is. 
You answer 12 questions and it will give you a full 10 page customized report on your design, your mindset, and your strategy, what you're doing right, what you might be doing wrong, on how you can really begin to create more of a work and life you love. And for those of you who stick to the end of this conversation, I will open myself up to you for one-on-one -on -one time, absolutely free, to talk about your situation and what you're trying to create and what you're looking to do. And I will share that at the end of the call for those of you who are able to stick around for that. But the success and happiness test is for anybody, okay? So here's the deal. When it comes to creating work that you love, there's all kinds of chatter um, that goes in your head. And, and the chatter is, is, you know, might seem real, it might seem logical, um, but it's never really the true thing that keeps you from doing what it is that you want to do. For a lot of you, if you have invested so much in your, your bachelor's degree and your MBA and you, you, you invested years in a company and you've gotten to a place where it's like, you know, success doesn't even feel like I thought it was going to feel. And you've got all these reasons why you can't move. You've got kids, you've got this, you've got that. Like all of these things are, 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 are situations and they're factors, and we're going to talk about how to navigate through those factors um, further on in the webinar, but that's really not the problem at all. The problem, and let me shift down so that I'm not in the way of your um, slides, but the, the problem really is that you haven't discovered and mastered the frameworks for getting highly paid to do work you love. And you're going to hear me speak a lot in frameworks. Because when it comes to creating work you love, it's not a one size fits all. Everybody that introduced themselves um, coming into the conversation from Patrick to Samia, um, to Tony, to whoever, there's, there's all kinds of ways that all of you can hit your goal, whether it's a business, whether it's a career, but how you do that is gonna depend on the stage that you're in in your life, it's gonna depend on your personality, it's gonna depend on your past, there's all kinds of ways that you can create dream job, business, all of that. But once you master the framework, anytime that you're presented with next level goal, you're going to be able to hit it. Um, and so I want to speak in terms of frameworks and not absolutes. So then you can begin to tweak it and apply it to yourself. Mm, let me talk about me. I was going to just jump into some stuff, but I'll give you a little background on who I am because I want you to understand why um, I'm so passionate about this work why I'm really good at this work, um, and how I might be able to support you as we go through this webinar. So as Deb mentioned, I wrote a book called Fast Lane, Wrong Direction, Insider Secrets to Redesign Your Success. And I wrote that book because I was that chick in the fast lane going in the wrong direction in my career for nearly 15 years. So I looked amazing on the outside. I was a six-figure earner. I was a key contributor to a firm, all of that. But I was bored. I was burned out. I was completely unfulfilled, and I didn't know how to fix that. And I made some radical changes in my own life and now um, my entire career is built around helping other people to discover design and get highly paid to do work that they love. Uh, I have coached and spoken and all of that for companies all around the world. <laughs> There's very little that I haven't seen, that I haven't heard, that I haven't, you know, whatever. And so um, I can relate to a lot of folks on the call just because I've been able to connect with so many different people in so many different ways. I've been on TV, I've been on radio, I've been on, you know, all those kinds of things. And that's great and all, and that gives credibility and that says, okay, she knows what she's doing. But the reality is that it wasn't always that way for me. So let me shoot you over here. Can we do, let me see here, maybe, let's do it this way. Deb, is there any way that I can just show me on this without having this whole thing here? Because I don't want to, I don't, well, let me just move it over this way. We'll see what we can do. But the bottom line is it wasn't always that way for me. So I uh, graduated from Stanford University in 1997, and I graduated with an industrial engineering degree. And, um, and I got an industrial engineering degree because um, before STEM was even a thing, I had mentors who were like, you need to go into, you know, science and technology. You're good at math. You're good at science. You're black. You're a woman. You're going to get paid. And I was a, an only child, and I was a military kid to teenage parents. And so my parents were like, girl, you better go and do what you need to do, take care of yourself. There's not going to be anybody taking care of you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we all have situations that we've grown up with that have conditioned us to, to make certain decisions on how we think, right? So I go off, and I become an engineer, um, even though I hated math, and I hated science. And so that just started this snowball effect of being in the fast lane going in, in the wrong direction in my career for a really long time. But here's the deal. 
when I was a kid, I wanted to be four things. I wanted to be a, a news anchor. I wanted to be a fashion magazine editor. I wanted to be a traffic controller and I wanted to be a solid gold dancer. So how a solid gold dancer ends up becoming an engineer is problematic. <laughs> and so some of you might think about, man, there were things that I thought I was going to be or wanted to be or wanted to do, and you ended up not doing that. And so like I said, I ended up fast lane wrong direction for a really long time. I was making good money. I was doing all that. I was getting six figures. I was continuously getting promoted and all of that, but I was suffering and I was going through burnout. I had all kinds of stress-induced illnesses. I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with all kinds of things. Then I got this idea that I was going to go and start a business. So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I decided with a roommate of mine that we were gonna go and we we're gonna buy all these houses, we were gonna make all this money, and we were gonna be rich. And we went out there and we did that. And we bought all these houses, and it was going really, really great until it wasn't. <laughs> the, the partnership was a partnership from hell. We had a bad divorce. Um, the, the economy crashed. Um, it was the big recession. And I wasn't prepared strategically. We hadn't set up our, our business well. And I literally lost everything. And when I say everything, I'm talking about savings. I'm talking about retirement. I'm talking about the whole nine. I lost everything chasing a dream. And I ended up with $1.97 to my name, literally with a half a million dollar mortgage to pay. So I needed to get really, really resourceful on how to start to figure this thing out. And so if you're afraid of creating your perfect work out of fear of losing everything, hello, I'm going to show you on this webinar how not to do that. <laughs> it is not the way to go. But I share all that because um, it hasn't always been pretty. You know, you get on webinars, you get on opportunities to talk and, you know, uh, and people think, oh my gosh, you, you see the glitter, you see the gold, but it was scary and it was dark. But I had the courage to always go for what was more meaningful in the marketplace. I was, I had the courage to take another step and to figure things out. And eventually I figured out what I was brilliant at. And there's something that you are brilliant at as well. It can be in the form of a career or a business or some experience that you had that you then want to go and package and put out into the world. And with that confidence can come big money and big impact. Okay. So let's get into it because I want to share with you how to begin to make this, this stuff work for you. So when I am teaching folks, I take them through um, kind of nine steps. And those nine steps will actually lead to three major outcomes. Finding your sweet spot, uh, setting your strategic sequence, and positioning your value. And so sometimes people think that creating your work is so confusing and it's so complicated. And, and the complication is really born out of fear. And I get that, right? Um, but the reality is if you can nail these three outcomes, your sweet spot, a strategic sequence and positioning your value, it is a wrap. You will be getting highly paid for work that you love. It really does boil down to these three outcomes. And when you master them, you can wash, rinse, and repeat. I'm going to break them down for you one by one. Okay. So finding your sweet spot. Let's talk about the sweet spot. The sweet spot is that professional role, um, that specific role in the marketplace where you're gonna find the most fulfillment and the greatest ease in doing your work. And it's a, it, it doesn't matter if it's a career or business, you know, you've gotta figure out your sweet spot. There's a lot of people that are running businesses, this is not their sweet spot. There's a lot of people that are in careers, it is not their sweet spot and it's hard to do um, and they're not seeing the success that they want and sometimes they're not making the money that they want either. But the sweet spot is this intersection between four questions. It is what do you do best what do you enjoy most? I'm going to pull myself down a little bit here. I can't do that. Darn it. I guess I'm going to pull myself back over here. What do you enjoy most? What's your story? And what's the market willing to pay for? Again, if you're able to nail these four questions authentically and honestly, it is a wrap. You're going to be able to figure it out. The questions are simple, but they're not easy to answer. And as I go through them, I'm going to show you why they're not so easy to answer. But the bottom line is there's also an order in which you need to answer those questions. We're going to answer them in the order. The problem is that most people will gravitate towards what's the market willing to pay for. That's the question that they ask first, and then they try to get in where they fit in, right? They're trying to figure out, well, where are the emerging markets? What companies are higher in? Who's going to pay me for this? And then they try to wiggle themselves into that. That question is an important question. But if you're trying to find your perfect work, it is not the first question you ask, it's actually the last question. And the reason is because the market will pay for anything. 
it will pay for anything from cannabis to cupcakes. <laughs> and so whatever it is that you want to do, there is some place in the market that's willing to pay for it and they're willing to pay for it at a premium. And so we're gonna talk about that as well. So let's, let's dive into the first question. What do you do best? What you do best, these are your talents, your skills, your gifts. You know, and for many of you on this call, the question is, do you really know what you do best? Now, when I say best, I'm not talking about what you do well, right? Um, I'm talking about what you do best, what you do almost effortlessly. And the reason is because, you know, what you think you do best is often clouded by what other people have told you that you do best. So many of you may have gotten pigeonholed in work, right? So you may have been 10, 15, 20 years in um, a company or in a workplace and you start doing something well. And then the market, whether it's your boss, it's your uh, coworkers, your colleagues, whatever, they start to box you in, right? So people start shoving money at you to manage this type of project or you know, manage this type of problem over and over and over again. And that's great, if that project or your problem is indeed your sweet spot, right? Then you become leading authority in your space and you can ride that train all the way to the bank. The problem is for most of us, that's not the case. We end up getting stuck, right? From going from role to role, company to company, doing what we do well, but not actually what we do best. And so you, it, you've got to dig deeper to figure out what you do best and what you do best may not be what you're currently getting paid for. Like, so when I sit down with people, I'm able, I, I can sit down with them for like 20 minutes and be like, this is your sweet spot. This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is why you haven't been doing it. And this is the way for you to be able to move forward. And I, I'm, I'm really good at that. And I couldn't explain, it's just my magic, right? But before I could even figure out how to get paid for it, it's something that I did effortlessly. And so for some of you on the call, you have to work hard to be good at what you do. <laughs> And that might be a clue that that's not your sweet spot. When I was in engineering, I was excelling, but it was so hard for me to do it. I had to work harder. I had to work longer. It, it didn't come easy because it wasn't my sweet spot. And so you might have to work hard to get better at your best, right? Like a Michael Jordan who is amazing at basketball, he works hard to get even better, but that's called mastery, right? But being good, at what you do and mastering that, that's where money is. But if you're finding that it's really, really hard um, for you to be able to master, that may not be what you're doing best. And so in order to even find your sweet spot, you've got to be able to articulate that very clearly for the marketplace. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk about what you enjoy most. What you enjoy most is a really, really difficult question for people to answer because most people do not believe that they can get paid to do what they enjoy most. And if I could see all of you guys on the webinar, which I cannot see now, and if I did a poll of raising hands and whatnot, and if I asked you hand on heart, do you really believe that you could get highly paid doing what you really enjoy right now? I believe that a lot of you would say no. But let me give you an example and a story of how this, how this has come about and how it works. So and I'm going to share a lot of stories with you in our conversation because you can sometimes look at the speaker and think, oh, well, yeah, yeah, she can do it or this or that or the other. But I'm going to show you story after story after story after story of regular Joe um, individuals who've taken these principles and totally transformed their careers, totally transformed their businesses, or they're doing really great things in the marketplace. And my prayer is that you find yourself in one of these folks. So when we talk about enjoying, you know, doing what you enjoy most, um, I met Paul, I was speaking at a women in technology conference uh, a couple years back. And at the end of my talk, um, I, you know, Paula was the last one left and she was sitting there and she was crying. And I was like, oh, have I offended her? <laughs> like, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Paula was a senior vice president of a uh, of business development for a technology company. And she sat there and she was like, you know what? I have for 20 years, all I've wanted to do is film. And she's crying and she's in tears. And, and she's telling me, you know, she, her, her husband was a stunt man in Hollywood. Like he was a stunt double for the Die Hard um, Bruce Willis movies. And um, her background was in technology and business development and some other stuff, but she'd gone, you know, to theater and acting school and stuff like that. And they have always wanted to make films and they wanted to make wholesome um, films, like really A quality, fast and furious kind of films without all the gratuitous sex and, and violence and stuff like that. And that's been, that had been their dream. And she's like, this is what I want to do. 
And so we ended up working together and they decided to go for it. Like her husband had scripts and things that he'd written that were just kind of filed away. Um, and so they came to me and they were like, you know, we've got a couple of investors who, you know, want to invest in us. We're going to do a PowerPoint and we're going to show this or that or the other. And I was like, absolutely not. Y'all are going to go and you're going to film a movie trailer and you're going to show these people the quality of film that you want to put out into the marketplace and what's different. Like they wanted to put stuff that had good messages and positive messages, but they wanted it mainstream, not like B-side corny movie. They wanted it were, you know, mainstream. And so anyway, fast forward, they go and they do it. Like they get a cast, they get crew, like they do the whole thing. And she comes back and she's like, you know, they have a movie trailer. They got their first $350,000 in funding lined up. They got product sponsors. They got a project. Fast forward to earlier this year, I get an email from her and she's like, Renessa, I just need to let you know, we put your name in the credits. Our movie is launching in the summer. And literally it's got, it's the, it's, they got, they are launching <laughs> a real, she didn't leave her job. She still needed to work because that job was funding, you know, other things but she found a way to be able to bring this, 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 this thing to life. It was what she enjoyed most. And she took some of what she did best, added it to her husband, and they were able to make that dream come true. And I think it's amazing. It's an amazing story. The next piece you've got to think about is what is your story? You know, what is your story? And what's really cool about your story is that so many of us, when we think about work, when we think about the marketplace, we think about our skills, we think about our talents, we think about, you know, what we're going to, you know, what, what coding skills we have, what degrees, what, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you the thing that you're going to get paid for most is your story. It, it has everything to do with who you are and what you bring to the marketplace. And I'm going to prove it to you. So Jeannie, I'm trying to move myself over here. I don't know where to move myself to get out of the way. So Jeannie um, is an amazing, you know, woman. She's very highly achieved, graduated from Stanford, did all this. And she always laughs and she says, you know, I, I totally disappointed my parents because I decided not to be a doctor. And, and in her culture, you know, there's something to be said for the kinds of professions that, you know, you take on and all this. But Jeannie ended up um, going a completely different path in her career. She ended up getting divorced, which was a stigma for her and her family. She ended up having cancer and having three tumors that she then overcame. And when she decided that she wanted to go out and start speaking, like she wanted to go out and help Asian American women professionals to really be able to elevate in their careers and this and that and the other. Um, but she'd been a stay at home mom for some years and there was just a lot going on. And so in her mind, she was like, I don't have anything to offer the market. Like I need to go out there and help them to, you know, you know, break the glass ceiling and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But all of that was so inauthentic to who she was. And I said, look, Jeannie, the things that people really want to hear from you have everything to do with your ability to overcome, has everything to, to do with your ability to really design the life that you want and live it and, and all that kind of stuff. Your the ability to overcome cancer and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And so she ended up deciding, okay, you know what? I'm going to package myself and I'm going to package what I have to offer differently. And so she actually founded an organization called the Bamboo Myth. And it's, it's really cool. I won't go into all those details, but the bottom line is she began to position her business around her story instead of trying to position her business and her message around, you know, how to network and how to this and that and the other. Because the reality is speakers are a dime a dozen. Keynote speakers, motivational speakers, trainers, dime a dozen. What's going to be different about you? The very first speaking engagement that she was able to, to land, she landed a keynote address in front of 1,500 people. She secured two corporate coaching clients at $15,000 a pop. Um, companies paid her to come in and help their leaders to be better leaders. And she sent me this email that was flooded with testimonials of people who had heard her speak. And they were like, I am in tears. Thank you so much for sharing. I needed to hear that. That's exactly what I went through. I know I can do it. Blah, 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 blah. The bottom line is Jeannie got paid for her story. There is, a, there, it, there is money in your message as well. Like, what does this mean for you? It means that when you're thinking about your interview, when you're thinking about your LinkedIn profile, when you're thinking about um, your website, um, your story matters. Like the fact that it may have taken you three times to pass the bar exam um, or the fact that you 
um, come from immigrant parents or that you were teaching people literacy or the fact that you had some challenge in your childhood that totally transformed who you were, like all of those things become fodder for what makes you distinctive and what makes you unique. And it could make you actually the perfect fit for that executive director role that you're trying to land at this nonprofit or whatnot. And so I say all that to say that your talent and your skills matter, but it is your story that is going to make the money for you and open the door and get people to resonate with you. And so there's a lot of you that are on this call, even now you resonate and you connect with me because of my story. If I'd come in here all perfect and then didn't have you know, any problems and any failures or whatnot, you wouldn't be able to relate to that. So it's the, it was the whole fast lane, wrong direction. The book, I'm going to share with you down the road why that positioning matters. But, but my ideal clients identify with being in the fast lane, going in the wrong direction. That's what makes me unique in the marketplace. And so as you think about your career, as you think about the roles that you want to take on, pay more attention to your story than you do to your degree, because the degree is going to stand by itself, but the money is going to be in your message. Does that make sense? And again, I can't see your faces, so I'm, I'm see, hearing virtual nods <laughs> to believe that you are hearing me here. So the fourth part of this question is, what will the market pay for? And this is where the rubber meets the road, because you got to get paid for what you do best. You got to get paid for what you enjoy most. You got to get paid for your story. Otherwise, all you have is a hobby, right? So I'm going to share how this plays in somebody else's life, right? So this beautiful woman on the left side of this, uh, of this magazine is, is Dr. Atiyah Abdel-Malik. And when I met her, she was the director of um, community, community affairs for a, a really large, um, what do you call it, uh, health insurance company. And Atiyah's story, you know, she was a, a nurse by training, so she has a healthcare background. Um, but she had gone through so many, she's gone through chronic illnesses that she's had to overcome. And those chronic illnesses had really forced her to get really focused on her health and her wellness, physically, emotionally, mentally, and otherwise. And then she tragically lost her, her, her young son, very tragically, and then had spent, you know, just so much time, years, just processing that grief and figuring out how, how to overcome that grief. And so she'd had a really successful career. In, in, in the corporate space and she decided she wanted to go out and she wanted to impact in a greater way. Now, if you think about her story, you know, she can help people overcome grief. She, there's all kinds of things that she wants she could do, but she was like, I don't want to get pigeonholed in grief. You know, I want to be out there really impacting um, a corporate environment, impacting women everywhere to be able to, to elevate themselves, right? And so again, the question becomes, what will the market pay for? Right, and the market isn't going to pay for somebody to come in and train their people about grief necessarily. They're not going to necessarily pay for that in the space that she wanted. And so when we got to talk, and we were like, okay, leading with well-being, like everything about her story had to do with well-being. And so we packaged her as a leadership speaker, and her her whole shtick is about leading with well-being. And if you're going to be a great leader, if you're going to be a great manager, your well-being matters. If you're going to ele elevate along the corporate space, your well-being matters, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and otherwise. And she's able to package her story and all those kinds of things in order for the market to want her and for her to stand out. And so you've got to then figure out where, who's going to cut the check for what it is that I want to do. And no matter what it is, whether you want to help kids, whether you want to innovate and take new products to launch, whatever, depending on what it is you want to do, then you go out and figure out who's going to cut the check. Is it going to be a company? Is it going to be an individual? Are we going B2B, B2C, all of that? Because everybody, there's always something that the market is willing to pay for, but you got to package yourself in a way that the market says, yes, you are my chick. Yes, you are my dude. Yes, <laughs> you know, we can make this happen. So again, these are the four questions that you have to answer. What do I do best? What do I enjoy most? What's my story? And what's the market willing to pay for? If you can nail that, you are going to find your sweet spot and where you belong in the marketplace. Step two is talking about your strategic sequence. Step two is what keeps many of you on this call from taking the leap to find work that you love because you don't know the proper sequence for your exit plan, right? Whether it's an exit plan into a new career, whether it's an exit plan into entrepreneurship or a plan to bring your big idea to life. And so you need to create a safety net to provide for yourself and your family as you make the shift so the order in which you take your steps towards your big dream, whatever that is, that matters. And one size does not fit all. 
and I'll show you what I mean. So when you're thinking about a strategic sequence, right, what prevents a lot of folks from creating work they love for months, for years, even decades, is that they don't know how to get there, right? And more accurately, they don't know how to think about how to get there. And here's what I mean. Some of you on this call might be thinking about current, quitting your current job. And when in actuality, that job could serve as financial fuel um, or the visibility platform for you to transition into a career or business that you really are passionate about if you work it right, okay? Um, but if you don't know what your next move is, if you don't know what your sweet spot is, if you don't design with the end in mind, then you don't know if you're sitting on a gold mine in this job or if you're sitting on a rotten egg, right? On the other hand, there are some of you rationalizing staying on a job right now. Oh, well, it's COVID or this is happening or that happening. And in actuality, you should be hightailing it out of there last year, right? And you're thinking that you know, you're playing it safe so that you can eventually do work you love, not realizing that the safety net is the biggest obstacle in doing work that you enjoy. It is sucking the life out of you. It is sucking the creativity, the innovation, the whole nine. You got nothing left mentally, emotionally, physically, or otherwise to build what you want, right? So I'm not saying jumping off a cliff and you know with no income and all that, but I am saying that it's important to start exploring your other options because you do have options and we're gonna talk about what those options look like in a moment, okay? So to create your, your, your strategic sequence, you gotta analyze your circumstances. Like what stage of life are you in? What are your finances look like? What's on the horizon? Let me move this over to the left for you. What's your risk tolerance? Not just your risk tolerance, but the risk tolerance of your partner if you're connected to somebody else. What's your level of urgency? What's your pace? Because some of you on the call, y'all can hustle, right? You can get out there and you can hustle and you can grind and you can sleep on the floor and you can do all that. Everybody's not built that way. <laughs> so you need to know your level of urgency and your level of pace to then determine how you're gonna move. You gotta understand your current capacity. Right? So for instance, in, in my case, I'm a 40, 44 year old woman. I've got a two year old daughter, um, my only daughter. And I'm, I'm building my business at a place in a way that I want to be present. I'm not trying to be all over the place, flying here, flying there, this and that and the other. So I, I redesigned my business purposely as I, when I got pregnant, because I wanted, I wanted to have a certain lifestyle. And so I started to focus a little bit differently. You might be thinking about, you know, when you're, I had, I had a, um, a client once who was like, I'm quitting my job and this and that, and I'm going for it. And I knew her husband and I was like, mm, mm -mm. <laughs> and the reason is because the risk tolerance for her partner was different. That didn't mean she couldn't jump out and do what she wanted to do. But I did know that if she did that, the uncertainty around that would create so much tension in their relationship that it would impede her ability to really succeed. So we took a much more uh, mitigate, uh, uh, a, a more conservative path for her to, to then be able to get there. But there are some of you on this call where you have partners and you have spouses who are wholly supportive of you and you're using them as an excuse for why you don't move forward. They're like, go for it, please, because you're going to be a much happier person if you just try it. <laughs> They're super supportive, but you're using it as an excuse. Well, I don't know my husband or I don't know if my wife, blah, 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 blah. The point I'm making here is that Many people look at the, the factors on the surface, and I'm gonna move myself someplace so that you can still see the factors, um, and they automatically assume that they can't make a move. I'm a single mom, I'm this, I'm that. And the saddest conversation I have are with remarkable people who know they should have made a move two, three years ago, but the factors have become the excuse for why they can't pursue work they love right now. Again, I got kids, I've got this, I've got, you know, student loans, blah, blah, blah. But the factors are not a stop sign to making the move, okay? Let's be very clear. The factors will tell you how to move. As I keep moving myself around on here, the factors will tell you how to move. Whether you move fast or you move slow or you move gradual or you, or you move radical. The question is not whether you move, it's just how that you move. So what does that mean for you? What it means immediately is that you need to decide yes, like whatever the heck it is that you say that you want to do, even if it's just, I want to figure out what I want to do. The decision has to be, yes, I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to step out because once you say yes, then you can begin to figure out why, right? Or how, right? Because your strategic sequence will then identify 
the easiest or fastest or most advantageous role for you to transition into right now that moves you towards your perfect work, right? And so what does that mean? It means that you ask yourself different questions. And I'm gonna set up a, a plethora of questions that you could begin to ask yourself to then determine how you're gonna move forward and how you're gonna make the pivot that you need to make, okay? First question, can you assume a different role within your current company? This is exactly what Jay did. And I told you I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in frameworks, I'm gonna talk in stories because if she can do it, you can do it. And so when I met Jay, she was a network engineer. Her passion was all around developing people and leadership development and all that kind of stuff. And she was doing a lot of that in her company's ERG and their affinity group. Like she was leading, she was always the one doing what Deb and, and Melsha and Maisha and all of them were doing. Like she was the one that was pulling all this stuff together to be able to help to equip other folks in her company to really excel, women in particular. And so when we got together, it was like, well, why not start doing that stuff in, you know, more formally within the company? So she ended up doing that. She ended up finding a role in talent development and, and she soared. So she went from the engineering space into talent development. Why? Because she had so much experience in the volunteer space. It wasn't like she went from doing that professionally and then got another role. She was doing it as a volunteer. And she had the acumen for it and she ended up assuming a different role. Her particular company went through huge rounds of layoffs. Lots of people were getting laid off left and right. She, however, was continuing to soar up the ranks and still to this day does. So can you assume a different role within your company? Should you keep your current job, restructure your time and build your perfect work on the side? That's what Paula did. I told you her story about wanting to build a film. She didn't leave her job. She simply decided that she was gonna build that thing while she had it, right? And so for you, can you keep your current job? Because when you find, when you design with the end in mind and you find what you really wanna do, you can get real productive on that boring job <laughs> to be able to build your perfect work on the side. Is that you? How can you position yourself now to catapult into your perfect work later? Some of you are in spaces where you can't make a leap now. You can't make a shift. Yvonne was in that space. Yvonne did business operations for a technology company here in the Bay Area. And what she really wanted to do was have much more of a social impact. She wanted to work on immigration. She wanted to work on education, on, on elderly issues, on all kinds of social issues. And she was like, you know what, Ransa? I'm a white woman that didn't have any of these problems. And I don't have a story that aligns me to any of these problems. <laughs> I have you know, kids that are in college and I have parents that I am elderly parents that I'm caring for so I can't quit my job and then go off and do this thing. You know, how do I make this, this happen? And so what we did is we took her, tech, not her technical skills because a lot of nonprofits are well-meaning and they're amazing, but they don't have the technical bandwidth and the technical know-how and the business operations to really run their, their, their organizations effectively. And so we were like, let's, let's get you connected to some of these organizations where you can serve, get on a board, this or that or the other. And so it turns out once we had that conversation, her company actually had a program where they set their employee, employees up on board of directors. Like they give them opportunities to be able to get on different boards. She ended up getting on a board for an amazing company that's doing the very social uh, innovation and having the impact that she, she craves and that she wanted to do and she is soaring and she's building social proof around her value because now she's now having an impact in that space. So in five years time, as she continues to add value, when she's ready to step out and pivot and do something totally different because that's the time frame she's given for herself, now she can package herself, not as this technology person or this business op person, but she can really have packaged herself as having that kind of impact. So again, her timeline is much more gradual, but she's stepping into her perfect work every day. And so too can some of you. Can you expand your authority within your organization? Ulta is, a, is a, a current client. She lives in Germany. And when she came, she's a technical writer. And when she came to me, she was, you know, she didn't want to like leave her job necessarily, but she was like, I am bored. Like, I just think that there's more I'm supposed to be doing, you know, with my life. And, you know, there's gotta be just more. I think I'm just supposed to be doing more, right? And so as we figured out her situation, she's a librarian, that, that's her background. So she's really great at researching, curating information, blah, blah, blah. She's also a physicist. And now she's in this, this technology company in Germany. Fast forward, what we figured out is that she wanted to start an ERG group 
in her company. Her company did not have anything that supported women on a high level in terms of mentorship and leadership and all of those kinds of things. Um, and so she, I was like, why don't you go do it? Go build it. Like go survey people, figure out what they want. You can talk to all kinds of folks in Europe and the US, um, best practices for building ERGs. There's lots of companies that are best places to work. Go find those people who, are, who have built those things in their organizations, figure out what they've done and go do it for yours. She was fired up. She's like, oh yeah, I could totally do that. Cause it was right up her alley of everything that she was about in terms of just developing people and stuff like that. That was last week. On March, on May 4th, you can see from the email, she's like, what a coincidence. The SVP of HR sends her an email and asks her, you know, what should we do about the post-corona working environment? And she was like, lo and behold, looky who, I've got an idea. And so it was only because she was willing to start having these conversations and asking these questions to figure out what she wanted to do that then literally she takes the step and the next step opens up for her. She's gonna have the opportunity to build the very first um, diversity initiative within that organization. She's got the sponsorship to do it right now and she's got carte blanche to be able to do it however she wants to do it. Why? Because she asked the questions, right? To start to figure it out. And so she can do it, you can do it. Can you take a part-time contract gig to, uh, or, or consulting role to bridge your money gap? That's exactly what Angelique did. It's exactly what I did. When I um, blew it on my, <laughs> my first business, when, when I lost everything and had nothing, um, I was like, okay, I need to go back to work. And all I knew was kind of the, the corporate grind, the six-figure grind and all that. And that's what I was going to go back and do. And I sat down and had a conversation with somebody that changed my life. She asked me the question. She was like, what do you really need right now? And I was like, I need money. I got a, a mortgage to pay. And she was like, no, you need money, but what you need more right now is time. You need time and flexibility to be able to build. So figure out how much money you really need so that then you don't give away your whole life in terms of time and you'll still be able to build what you need to build. Had she not had that conversation with me, I would not be having this conversation with you because what I realized is that I didn't need all that I had before. I needed a subset of that that could be seed for me to then go and build what I needed to build. And so I took part-time contracting consulting work because I was a management consultant in my background, I had that skill. And so I went and I did that for 20 hours a week and I was making good money at part-time money, but it allowed me the freedom to go and build. I would not be doing my perfect work had I not thought more strategically about how to make it happen. And so I share all these examples with you to let you know there are options that you have for moving forward. And it's not always all or nothing. It's not always, you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater. You have options. And if you begin to think about your options, just like Ulta, like doors will begin to open and intersections will begin to happen because you're putting one foot in front of the other and you're ready, as opposed to sitting on the sidelines and thinking about it. Fair? All right. Oh, I forgot one. If you're an entrepreneur, you know, part of your strategic sequence is to think about where are you going to focus? The challenge and, and where many entrepreneurs go all sorts of sideways is that we can be in the right business. We may be serving the wrong customer, offering the wrong product, or building the business in the wrong way. And so as an entrepreneur, you need to begin to think about what's your specific niche? Like what specific problem are you going to be solving for the market? Who's your target market? Who do you really serve? You know, when I started doing my work, I didn't know what I was going to be. You know, I, I just, I left my corporate job. I was like, I just want to coach people. And I was like a life coach, a success coach. I didn't know. It didn't matter what problem you had. If it was a weight loss problem, if it was a job problem, if you had to find a, a, find a man problem, I'll just solve whatever problem you had, which again was recipe for broke. I didn't know who, I didn't, A, didn't know the specific niche and what problem I wanted to solve, and B, I didn't have a specific target market. And it wasn't until I really honed in on the fact that I want to talk with high achieving professionals, people who want to get paid, people who are unapologetic about wanting to get paid, and then I want to match them to their perfect work. That's the conversation I want to have all day long. And when I got really clear about that, then my audience became my right audience. And I didn't have to dumb it down, change it, dilute it, or whatnot in order to figure that out. And so if you want a product or a service or whatever it is you're trying to build, you got to know what problem you're solving, who you're going to solve it for, and then you've got to know what's going to be your strategy for attracting your customer. 
every strategy works. Brick and mortar, direct mail, online, Facebook ads, speak, and there's all kinds of ways you can build your business, but they don't all, they work for somebody, but they don't all work for you. And so you've got to be really, really clear about the, the, the sequence. And a lot of them have great business ideas, but you're not clear on how the best way it is for you to build it, given who you are. So that becomes really, really critical. That's step two. That's all about the sequence. Now we're about to dive into step three. Okay. And step three is really where um, you start to think about the money, right? Um, it's the third and it's the final step. And um, what's really, really important about this is that the marketplace does not pay for your passion. So some of you have, you know, have you filled out your success and happiness test and you want to do work that you're passionate about and all that. Passion is great, but the market doesn't pay for passion. It doesn't pay for your skill. Uh, it's not, it doesn't matter necessarily that you have an MBA. That just gets you qualified. The market pays, pays for the value that you bring. And if you miss that point, it is the number one reason why people don't get highly paid doing work that they love. Because in any role, in any company, with any product, with any service, there are some people who make a little bit of money at it, and there are some people who make a lot of bit of money at it. And the difference is always going to be in the perception of the value that they bring to the market. So what you see here is on the left side, you've got a beat up old box, you know, that has gone through a ringer. On the right side, you've got a tiff Tiffany package. And packaging is, it's not about like how you dress necessarily and what you say, although that can be a factor. Package is more about the perceived value of your offer. And so if you're thinking about a business, the packaging is going to determine whether or not people are going to pay a premium for you or they're not. If you, people who want to be coaches and trainers and those kinds of things, and you're asking for hourly wages, you're packaging yourself in a way where you're not going to get paid. And so we're going to talk about how this plays in both the career side and the business side so that you begin to understand how this is going to make a difference for you. So um, I love telling Kelvin's story. I love telling Kelvin's story. And I love telling Kelvin's story because he's a black man. Um, and we're, we're, this is all very appropriate here. Um, but because it's just remarkable. Um, so when I... Um, first met uh, Kelvin, he was in criminal justice. And um, so he worked in Washington, D.C. I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time. And then he decided, he, be, he entered into the ministry. So he became a pastor. And then he went off into the foreign missions. And he left and went to the South Pacific and started leading churches out in Fiji, in like Fiji out there, Australia, like South Pacific. And he stayed there for, for several years. And then he came back to the States after several years, he brought him and his family back. And when he came back, 9-11 had happened. And so before he left, the world was different. And then when he came back, it looked completely different. There was the Department of Homeland Security, like all these things have changed very much like today. Like COVID has happened and COVID is disrupting um, life as we know it, business as we know it, operations as we know it in every way. And so when he came back, he was like, I, he wanted to get back into criminal justice. He wanted to leave the ministry. Um, but he was like, I, 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 I'm not attractive for the work that I want to do. You know, he had like, people are going to hire a pastor. And so we had to repackage him. And it wasn't about buzzwords on a resume. It was literally about translating the work that he'd done overseas into obvious relatable value. Um, and so I helped him to see that he wasn't just a pastor leading a church. Like he had really um, the equivalent of uh, like business unit experience. Like he was leading stuff. And once he was able to embrace that and be able to talk through it, he was able to get his foot in the door in the federal government. Very shortly thereafter, he ended up um, leading a key initiative for the White House national security team because he learned to position his value in a certain way. And then he sent me a text message uh, not long ago um, he left the, the, the White House and he had gone and become an executive director of this um, cybersecurity um, uh, company and they had him go ring the NASDAQ bell. And so he sent me this text and he was like, I was asked to do the closing bell at NASDAQ. He's like, they actually put my face on the building of the Times Square. And like he had gone from the ministry field to the White House to Times Square, all because he learned to position his value. And I'm telling you, if, 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 if Kelvin can do it, you can do it. It's, it's all about positioning your value. But, but, but what does that mean, right? You've got to put the bait on the hook that the fish want to eat. The fish, whether they be customers or hiring managers, they're not looking um, for modesty. 
from you. Let me pull myself up again. I keep moving myself so that I can actually leave, whatever. Anyway, so they are not looking for modesty. This is not the time, you know, they don't have a t the inclination to be digging for gold when it comes to you, right? So it's your responsibility to tell the market why you're critical. It's your responsibility to, to, to tell the market what your experience means. It's not their job to figure it out. It's your um, responsibility to tell what your story means for the business, whether the business is a company or whether the business is a customer. You've got to take inventory of your impact on the business. So when you're talking about who you are, um, when you're introducing yourself, when you're writing about yourself on, on a resume or LinkedIn or whatever, you're not leading with your title. You're not leading with your task. You're not leading with your degree or your skills. You're leading with the impact that you make on the business. What do you want to be known for, right? And it doesn't matter what you are known for. You declare to the market what you want to be known for, and that sets your reputation, if that makes sense. Let me give you an example. I um, was having a conversation with um, a woman named Holly, and we were just talking about her career. She's trying to figure out what she wanted to do. And I was like, you know, what, what, what's different about you? Like, tell me, who are you? And she's like, oh, you know, well, I'm detailed oriented and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, that ain't gonna work, right? <laughs> and so, and not to say that she's not detail oriented, she really is, um, but it's a vanilla answer. It's not gonna stand out. Nobody's gonna pay you for that. And so as we began to dig, um, I, I, I really began to understand. I was like, Holly, you're the backbone of an organization's growth. Like, because every all companies want to grow, but there's good growth and there's bad growth. And there's sometimes companies will grow and they'll grow ahead of themselves and they don't have the systems and the logistics and everything and the processes in place to really be able to sustain their growth. In fact, they outgrow themselves and the company breaks down. I was like, you're the backbone of an organization. You're the one who allows, you allow an organization to grow and be able to sustain that growth. And because as she talked about all the different places that she had worked and what she'd done, like that was truly who she was. And so she needed to be able to communicate about herself that way, because that's a value that an organization would pay for. If they're trying to grow, they want the person who's going to be on the back end, making sure they don't fall off the rails. But she had to begin to talk about that differently, because that's what gets you highly paid and distinguishes you from the market. Simple example. I um, was looking for a fitness program and, you know, fitness programs are dime a dozen, but there was a fitness program out there that was all about, it was called the Cellulite Fitness Program by Joey Alice. And I was like, ooh, Cellulite, that's what I need. I need that program. <laughs> and he had positioned himself all around helping women burn cellulite off their thighs. And I was like, yes, Joey, you and me, right? But the when you go through his stuff, it's no different from any other kind of workout thing or whatnot, but he positioned his value in such a way that somehow it seemed different because he put the bait on the hook that this fish wanted to eat. So whether you're thinking about business or you're thinking about career, that's how you have to begin to think about value. Another example, Laurel, um, Laurel works full-time um, as a Salesforce administrator and she has a side gig um, consultancy, like she's trying to build. And when I met Laurel, she had, you know, she helps nonprofits, she helps businesses implement their Salesforce, you know, technology and all that. And when she came to me, she had never made more than maybe $1,500 for an engagement ever. Um, and when I said, I mean, Laurel was a bad girl. Like she knows herself. She's smart. She, I mean, she's, she's compassionate. Like she really cares about her clients. She's amazing. And yet, she was sitting here peddling her, her, her services for like $75 an hour, $150 an hour, this, that, and the other. And I was like, Mo, you just got to charge more. Like you got to pack, people will pay. You got, we got to package this differently. You got to charge more. Like, it, it, she, was, she needed to get to the Tiffany package, right? And she pushed on this and pushed on this and pushed on it for like three months. And then she finally was like, okay, fine. And literally, we just packaged it differently. We just, that's all we did. We just positioned her. It wasn't, she didn't do anything different. She didn't add any more service. She, we just packaged the, the services so that they had more value. Get this email from her and she's like, I just got off the call with my new client. They want to spend 5K for blah, 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 blah. Mind you, $1,500 was the most she'd ever made on that engagement before. And she's worth more than 5K. But it all came down to positioning your value. So there's some of you on the call that you're not earning the kind of money that you deserve 
in your in your in your career. Um, you're not charging enough in the business that you're actually running or thinking about running. Um, you don't see that people would really be willing to pay a premium for what you have to offer. And so positioning your value is going to be critical for you in terms of upping the ante around what you get paid. Okay. So I promised that I was going to share with you how I landed my first $18,000 client when I took the steps to, to, you know, took the leap to do work that I love. And I'm going to show you how that applies, how you can apply the same strategies to your situation. Um, because here's the deal. This is not about leave your job, go start a business. Business is not for everybody. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. But these strategies you're going to be able to take away and apply to whatever your goal happens to be. So when I started speaking, I didn't know anything about speaking. You know, I, I didn't know how to get booked. I didn't know anything about that. Um, I was, and I was tempted to just wing it, you know, and go give it a go because, you know, I'm smart and I've accomplished something and I'm sure I could figure it out, right? Um, but we all know how that worked with the real estate thing. I didn't figure that out so well. <laughs> so, so I decided to get stupid. And all I knew is that there were some speakers who made a little bit of money and there were some speakers who made a lot of bit of money. And I knew that I wanted to be a speaker who made a lot of bit of money. And so I started looking for someone who could teach me how just the business of speaking. I didn't want someone to teach me how to talk, like how to stand over here and move your hair this way. And I didn't, I didn't want the mechanics of speaking. I wanted the business of the money of speaking. Like, how are you doing this? Right. And so I wanted someone to teach me how to get paid. Here's the deal. There are a lot of you, everybody on this call, clearly, if you're in this organization, you have invested enough of yourself to have a graduate degree. You've got a bachelor's degree, you've got your MBA, um, you might have gotten lots of other kinds of certifications. And sometimes we think that because we've done these things and we've had these achievements, we don't ask enough questions. We don't humble out and put ourselves out there and say, hey, I want to do this thing and I don't know how to do it, or I don't know who to talk to, or I don't know what to say. And I'm saying that the first thing that you got to do if you're trying to, to build whatever you're trying to build next is get stupid, put the degree to the side, put the ego to the side and begin to be willing to ask, ask the questions that you need answers to and even be willing to say, I don't know what I don't know. Tell me what I don't know. And that's the first thing that I did was I need to figure out who knows how to do this thing and how, how can I learn from this person on how to do it. So the second thing I did, um, I found a coach, right? And he, he was all about the business of speaking. And I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to, you know, whatever, whatever. And so I hired him. Here's why this was important. Sometimes you need somebody outside of you who can think about you objectively. Because when I came to him, I had this whole other idea of what I was going to do. And if I showed you the first book that I thought I was going to write, it would have been laughable. But I had this grand idea. And my grand idea was going to have me be a dime a dozen coach, a dime a dozen speaker. I was gonna look just vanilla, just like everybody else. And I remember sitting down with him and I said, you know, I'm planning to write this book one day. It's called Fast Lane, Wrong Direction. And I'm gonna, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just talking about what I'm gonna do down the road. And he was like, hold up. What you're gonna do is you're gonna write that book now and you're gonna build your coaching program on that book and you're gonna build your positioning on that book. And sure enough, he was right. Instantly, I went from dime a dozen passion and purpose speaker to being a speaker and a coach who perfectly positioned myself to attract my ideal clients and to be able to get in front of corporate audiences. And who knows how long it would have taken me um, to figure that out. And so by investing in myself, you know, I was able to do it faster. And so whatever it is that you want to do, find the person who has done the thing and then pay them to teach you how to do it. I'm not talking about mentors. People get to our level of, of, of accomplishment and we're like, well, I'm gonna, I'm looking for a mentor and I'm looking for a sponsor. Those are great. Do that. However, comma, a mentor is not obligated to your success. You got to get in where you fit in with a mentor. You got to get in where you fit in with their time. And so if you want to get to the C-suite, find somebody who's helping people get to the C-suite and go pay them to teach you what you need to do to get yourself there. If you're trying to be a better leader, a better manager, of, of people in large organizations, find the person who's equipping people how to do that and go pay them to teach you how to do it. You pay for speed. Keep your mentors, but pay for speed. Fair? Third thing. What was really great about that particular person that I invested in, one of the big, big, biggest pieces of advice that he gave me was to begin to market my book before it was finished. 
it seemed kind of silly to me, but I was like, well, you know, okay. You know, so as I started introducing myself and talking about myself or writing about myself, I would always say, you know, um, I would make posts about Fast Lane Wrong Direction book. I would always say I'm the, you know, the, the author of the upcoming book, Fast Lane Wrong Direction, blah, blah, blah. And then lo and behold, one day I get this outreach from social media. Somebody had seen my post and that person was the head of um, global learning and development for a manufacturing company. Um, actually here um, in the Bay Area. And they were like, yeah, we'd love for you to come to our organization and speak. And we'd like 400 copies of your book. And I was like, 400 copies of the book that's not finished? Like in my mind. And they were like, yeah, we want to talk to you to talk on these campuses and blah, 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 blah. And they said, well, how much would you charge? And that particular coach gave me advice on how to negotiate that conversation. And I said exactly what he told me to say. And mind you, up until that point, I'd never made more than $4,500 ever speaking. And when, so I, you know, said what I had to say, and I was like, you know, blah, 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 you know, what's your budget and, you know, da, 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 da. And they were like, oh, well, you know, our budget is $20,000. Is that enough for you? I'm like doing the happy dance. Again, I'd never made more than $4,500 on a speech ever. They want 400 books of a book that's not finished. And they want to pay me $20,000 to do it. So I negotiate with them. I'm like, oh, you know, for you, we'll do it for 18K, you know, blah, blah, blah. The point is, I wasn't ready, but I had to get ready on the way. That was the advice that was given to me. And a lot of us on the phone call, they're on phone call, on the webinar, there are things we want to do that you are perfectly positioned and ready to go for it now. And you're giving yourself reasons why you're not ready. And here's the deal, you might not be totally ready. My book wasn't finished, but I had 18,000 incentives to go ahead and wrap that up and get it done right? so that we could get it marketed and out and, and this and that. I got ready on the way. Ladies, in, in, when you're in, in the car and you're doing your commute and you're stopping at the stoplight and you're putting on lipstick or you're putting your shoes on in the parking lot, blah, blah, you know how to get ready on the way. And for some of us, the only thing that's standing in the way of you doing what you want to do is that you're not willing to get ready on the way. If you get ready on the way, the opportunity will present itself for you. Ulta, the German woman that I shared with you, she made the decision she was going to build this ERG. We were getting the survey ready to put out to the entire organization to figure out what they wanted. She was getting ready on the way. And as she got ready, look, opportunity comes her way. SVP is like, yes, I'm ready to sponsor you for this. Had she not been ready on the way, that opportunity would not even have crossed her desk. Fair, that's the difference on what it's gonna take um, for you to be able to step up. So today I promised a few things um, on this call. I promised that I would <clears throat> reveal the four specific questions that initially shift you from no idea to crystal clear on your ideal role. We talked about that. What do you do best? What do you enjoy most? What's your story? What's the market willing to pay for? Nail that, it is a wrap, I promise. We talked about how to strategically position yourself to do meaningful work that excites you without growing, going, going broke. You got to know your strategic sequence. There's a sequence for every single one of you on this webinar to go and get what you want. We just got to figure out what's the right strategy for you. We talked about the number one mistake that will prevent you from getting highly paid in a new career or business and from getting that big idea off the ground. It's this whole idea of not pitching your value. You're pitching skill, you're pitching talent, you're pitching passion. Marketplace doesn't pay for that. Marketplace pays for value. And you have to learn how to articulate your value in a way that the marketplace wants it, right? We talked about the three simple actions that I took to secure my first $18,000 client and how you can do the same. Everybody on this call can get stupid and start asking more questions and get humble and open up about what you don't know. Everybody on this call can pay for speed. Find the person who can teach you what you want to do. Go pay them to teach you and move, move the heck on. Everybody on this call can, what was the third one? Ah, get ready on the way. Everybody on this call can get ready on the way. Okay. And we talked about why your past successes, not your fear of failures, will be the biggest roadblock. And again, because a lot of us think, I've been able to accomplish this. I've been able to accomplish that. I lead these people. I lead that people. I've got this degree. I've done that. I should be able to figure this out. Maybe not at least not on your own. So that could be the biggest thing standing in your way. And then we talked about the framework. What are the three steps that you need to, to go through to discover design and get highly paid to do work you love? Find your sweet spot, figure out your strategic sequence, position your value, wash, rinse, repeat. Every time you're going to a next level, that's what you're gonna do. Fair? Oh, 
Ooh, this looks like it's a double of the slide. Let me keep going through that. I think their slide is on there twice. I'll have to fix that. So now you get to make a decision. Um, you get to have a choice. You are on this webinar for a reason. It is my hope that you have taken everything that you need to take from it to really be able to think differently about whatever the, the career, the business, the big idea that you have. But now you get to make a choice to be accountable to what you want to do next. And at every kind of webinar, live talk conversation, when I have capacity, I will always open up my calendar in support of the people that are on the call. And so I will open up my calendar to you for 72 hours to speak with you personally about how we can apply these strategies to your career, to your business, to that big idea that you have. The cost is totally free. It's completely complimentary to you. Um, but, um, and here's what needs to happen in order for you to have access to that. If you want that conversation and if you want us to reach out to schedule with you in the chat box right now, open the chat box, enter your name, enter your email address, an email that you check, <laughs> um, and enter your, your mobile number. And I ask for your mobile number because sometimes emails bounce or something crazy happens and we want to know how to contact, with, contact you. So just your first and last name, your email, um, and your, um, your, your mobile number. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we capture that from this webinar and then we'll reach out to you for that. The strategy session is not for everyone. And I wanna make sure that it's very clear. The strategies, perfect work strategy session is for you. If you've got a long buried dream or a desire to create a career or business that you truly love, even if you don't know where to start, like I am brilliant at helping people figure that stuff out. And so if you're like, man, this is me, then this conversation is for you. It's for you if you're not experiencing the success and fulfillment that you crave, even if you're making good money. I've made great money. I know what I, I know the security that can come from that. It's awesome. And I know the hunger that comes when it's like, man, I just know I'm bored out of my mind. You know? And so if that is you, then the, the, the strategy session would be for you. It's for you if you believe that with the right guidance, strategies, confidence, and swift kick in the pants, you can take a giant leap forward to bring your big idea to life. If because you got a sense for my personality. I kind of just come with it. I come with it in love, but I'm also straight because I believe that you deserve to be doing what you love and I believe you should be getting paid. And if you think that, you know, if you know what to do, you can do it, then, then come on, let's have a conversation and let me see where that low hanging fruit is. If I can't support you, I'll tell you that. If I can introduce you to someone else who can, I'll do that as well. Nothing but good will come out of that conversation. However, it's not for you if you want great information on how to get highly paid to do work you love, but you're not ready to act on it right now. That's okay. That might be the situation. If that's the case, take the success and happiness test. Get on my email list. I send out great information every week. Stay connected to me if that's what you need to do, but the strategy session is not right for you right now. It's not right for you if you're looking for a sounding board to talk through challenges with your current leadership or your role, but you're not looking to explore a radical shift. That's not the, that I'm not the right person for that. And the strategy session would not be right for that either. And if you're merely looking for resume and job support, like, hey, I just want somebody to, to redo my resume, that kind of thing, the strategy session is not for you. But I can recommend you to really awesome people that I respect. And if you need that, put that in the chat box as well. And I'm happy to make a connection for you with people who can support you in that way. Is that fair? So um, again, enter your name your email address and your cell phone number in that chat window and we'll make sure to reach out and give you access to do that, okay? So if you would like to connect with me and stay connected with me, I'll put myself in the middle here. Um, you can uh, find me, the best way is on LinkedIn because um, that's where I play. So um, connect with me there on LinkedIn. Go straight to my website, renessaspeaks.com and um, get on my list. I send out really, really great stuff around that and I can stay connected with you that way. Um, I'll open up the floor. I'll open it back to Deb and Melsha and the team. Um, and if there are you know, Q and A questions that people wanna ask, comments that you have, I'm, I'm totally open to just chatting. Like we can take the, the, the whole screen share off and just kind of chat a little bit, but make sure you get your information in there if you wanna have a conversation with me and you want me to work some magic with whatever it is that you're thinking about. 
Um, but with that, I'll end it. I hope this has been valuable for you, but I, I'm totally fine to stick around and connect with people. Um, and for those of you who can't, feel free uh, to log off as well. But Deb and Maisha and Melsha, I will take, um, I will stop sharing and then I will leave it over to you guys to tell us what to do. Stop share, let's do that. Okay, I think we have some questions. Um, Maisha, will you manage that, you and Melsha? I don't see questions. Um, a lot of people are answering for the email, and so I'm taking the, those down. But uh, no questions in here. I have loved the presentation and your delivery. Um, and then everybody else is adding in their information, so. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think someone had a question about um, where the chat, chat box is. I hope that person was able to find it. It should be right below underneath. Oh, so I think so. Is the chat box here the Q&A box? The Q&A box is the chat box. This is a webinar. Perfect. Will we be able to still have access to the Q&A box um, when the when the webinar is over or do we need to capture that screen? Um, we should have access to that. I okay. believe. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Any questions? Anybody? Um, open book. So however I can support you, open book. <laughs> so. Well, special thanks to you, Renisa, for a very informative presentation. We really appreciate your support of the chapter and um, we got some really good information. I don't know about you guys, but my, note, my notepad is full and uh, we'll be recording this and making it available. We'll bring you more information about that. And also, Renisa, thank you so much for your generous offer to do one-on-ones with folks who have signed up already. That's very generous of you. So please reach out to Renessa. Is it Renessa? Um, yes, Renessa. Please reach out to Renessa, please. Uh, when you, if you have any questions, you have any support concerns, um, just reach out to her. She's pretty nice. And I appreciate, again, Renessa, your support. Um, thanks also to Maisha Robinson, Robertson, she's our Chapter Director of Programs, Melsha uh, Key, who is responsible actually for putting this together for us. She introduced us to um, Renessa and I'm very appreciative of that. As you guys may know, Melsha is our VP of Admin and um, also want to thank our Board of Directors, all our members and everyone who has participated on this call. Thanks for sticking in there with us. And it, again, if you're interested in membership in the National Black MBA, San Francisco Bay Area chapter or volunteering, please let us know by reaching us at marketing at sfnbmbaa.org. So we wish everyone to have a great evening, great health. Please continue to follow CDC guidelines and uh, remain safe. So thanks again, everyone, and have an enjoyable evening and weekend. Hey, Deb, I think that there might be people that have cute questions. What we oh, have. they're coming in? Oh, okay, good. Be muted. Um, so okay. there's a couple of questions that have come through the Q&A, which I'm happy to address and answer, but it might have been that people could not unmute or something. I don't know, but or maybe not. Okay. Any questions through the Q&A? I can't see them, but... <laughs>